Hello, I'm Melissa Robbins coming at you from the Peace Garden Park Amphitheater in Stone Mountain, Georgia for this week's episode of Over My Dead Body. We usually conduct our interviews in a cemetery, but with Tupac Shakur, we're dealing with unusual circumstances. Hey, I can't help it they cremated me. I was too young to be right in my will. We're just happy we were able to find you. Rumor has it your ashes were spread over the Pacific Ocean or in your mother's garden in Georgia, or smoked up by your hip-hop group, The Outlaws. None of the above. Although some people think they took my lyrics from Black Jesus, literally. Last wishes niggas smoked my ashes, huh? Okay, so here we are at the formerly known Tupac Amaru Shakur Center for the Performing Arts, known as the Peace Garden Park Amphitheater. I'm not sure why the name was changed, but rumor has it that some of your ashes have been spread right here. What's up, Melissa? And where's my statue? According to TMZ, the new one is on its way. I hope they bolt it down this time. The other one's probably listed on eBay. Tupac, it's really a pleasure to meet you. Thanks for fitting us into your busy schedule. No problem. You might not know this, but you lived an equally prolific life dead as you did when you were alive. In 2002, you were named one of the top earning dead celebrities. You're the first hologram to perform at Coachella, and you still managed to put out platinum selling albums since your death in 1996. I try. There was even a Broadway musical called Holla If You Hear Me, in which your music was used. How did it do? It closed after 38 performances. You win some, you lose some. Now, I know who you are, but can you give our listeners a little backstory on your upbringing? No problem. I was born in 1971 and grew up in East Harlem. My birth name is Lasan Parrish Crooks, but my mom changed it to Tupac Amaru II after an Incan chief who got executed. That turned out to be ironic. Your mom sounds like she was an activist. Yeah, my mom's was an active member of the Black Panthers, in the 60s and 70s. I was in her stomach when she was in jail fighting a charge that the Black Panthers were conspiring to blow up builders in New York. They actually believed your mom was a bomber? Yep. You gotta remember the government felt the Panthers were detrimental to society. J. Edgar Hoover ran the FBI and was a racist motherfucker, even though it turned out he was wearing a matching bra and panties. Anyway, the police showed up and treated my moms like shit. NPR ran a documentary that stated your mother was a strong, intellectual woman and that she acted as her own attorney without ever having to been to law school. That's correct. She represented herself day in and day out for eight months, all while she was pregnant with me, and she was acquitted. Her activism and focus taught me how to be community-oriented and to analyze society, which later on went into my music. And at some point, you moved to Baltimore. Yes. When I was 15, my mom, sister, and brother moved there, and moms got me into the Baltimore School of the Arts. The same high school as Jada Pinkett Smith? Same one. Look, Melissa, Jada is still my heart. She was my closest friend my whole life. I even wrote poetry for her, although she never heard it until after I died. The poem called Jada? I see you put two and two together there. You are the omega of my heart, the foundation of my conception of love. When I think of what a woman should be, it's you that I first think of. That's beautiful. No, it's not. No wonder I never hit that. I'm not exactly Maya Angelou when it comes to poetry. So you didn't date Jada? We tried, but there was no electricity. 
Hard to believe since she was so fine. But our connection was pure. It was spiritual. Although I'll admit I jacked off to her picture every night of my life and still do. Even now? Is this morning recent enough? That's impressive. Now, when did you move to California? In 1988. When I was 17, we moved to Marin County. I performed in all my high school productions, but then had to drop out because of my mom's drug habits. But that led to me meeting Layla Steinberg. I started taking her poetry classes. She organized my first concert with my group at the time, Strictly Dope. After that night, I got signed and traveled with the hip-hop group, Digital Underground. I used to listen to them all the time back in the day. The first song I did with them was Same Song on the Nothing But Trouble soundtrack, where I made my film debut. The following year is when I released my first album, Tupacalypse Now. In the 90s, a lot of people would say that your music was labeled as gangster rap. Do you agree? Would you consider Marlon Brando a gangster actor? No. He's an actor. Same as Axl Rose. They're not gangster rock and rollers. They're just rock and rollers. I'm a rapper. That's what I do as an artist. Many rappers today, like Eminem, The Game, and Nas, said that Tupacalypse inspired them. Even though the album didn't create waves in the beginning, there was some controversy surrounding it because of your topics with the police. <laughs> Funny thing is that I never had a prison record until my first single, Trapped. They arrested me because I was jaywalking, just minding my own business. Then they beat the hell out of me. I sued them for $10 million and settled for $42,000. They should have paid you the $10 million. Like the rest of my family, there was always issues with the cops. In 1993, two drunk cops shot at my car in Atlanta. That's right. Then they tried to lie about it. Then damn Quayle started criticizing my album after some kid's defense attorney said his client shot a state trooper because he was influenced by my first album. All I wanted to do was rap about things that affected young black males, and I ended up being the media's kicking post for all of them. Some would say you inspired the Black Lives Matter movement by pointing out police aggression within the black community. I'm proud that I inspired protests against police officers who target brown and black brothers and sisters. Changes still need to be made. Besides police brutality, what other topics did you talk about in your music? Ironically, my first song was about gun control. A friend of mine was shot and killed, and that's what started my music career. I also had songs that dealt with poverty, unemployment, poor education, disunity and violence, black-on-black crime, crack addiction, and even teenage pregnancy, like my song, Brenda's Got a Baby. And you also starred in a movie. That kind of just happened. I showed up to support my digital underground bandmate, Money B, but the producers let me audition. Then we all went to dinner to see if we clicked as a group, and on the ride home with the producer, I ended up arguing with the cab driver. I think that sealed the deal on my playing Bishop and Juice. Ha! What were you arguing about? We were going back and forth about why cab drivers don't pick up black people. I almost punched the guy but felt that I would only succeed in making his point. They even used some of my own words from the argument in the movie to make my character more authentic. And Juice was a hit. That's when people took notice of my music and my album started to sell. So you can trace my success to an argument I had with a racist motherfucker in a taxi cab. <laughs> then came your second album. It was called Strictly For My Niggas. And as soon as I dropped it, I sold two million copies. Tupac, our switchboard is on fire. Would you mind taking a few calls? Not at all. We have Aisha from Los Angeles on the line. Oh my God, Pac, I knew you weren't dead. I swear, I saw you just last week on Long Beach Boulevard. That wasn't me, Aisha. Well, y'all were talking about my favorite album, Strictly, which has my favorite song of all time on it. Keep your head up. Damn, that song got me through some tough times. And ooh, and I loved I Get Around and, and holler if you hear me. And your question for Mr. Shakur is? 
I just felt like he wrote that album for me. Especially Keep Your Head Up. When I was raising my son on my own in Harlem, his music made it easier to get through the day. Like we was struggling to make do for rent. Your words meant the world to me. Well, that's why I said, the black of the berry, the sweet of the juice. I say the dark of the flesh, then the deep of the roots. I give a holler to my sisters on welfare. Tupac cares if don't nobody else care. And uh, I know they like to beat you down a lot. And when you come around the block, brothers clown a lot. But please don't cry, dry your eyes, never let up. Forgive, but don't forget, girl, keep your head up. Ooh, I just came three times. That's my girl. Hey, Tupac. What was it like to work with Janet Jackson? We worked on Poetic Justice in 1993, and yeah, she was great. She was a natural playing a homegirl. I got the role that every man in America wanted, to kiss Miss Janet Jackson. I was so excited. I even practiced with 30 wads of bubblegum. As soon as we did it, I was like, cut, no way, let's do it again. The scene at the beauty salon? Yeah. Is it really true that she asked you to take an AIDS test while shooting that movie? Yeah, that bullshit happened. But I don't know if that came from Janet or her boyfriend or her team. They wanted me to take an AIDS test for the love scene. I told them if I get to have sex with Janet, I'll take whatever test they want. I'll even donate a kidney. But if it's just a Hollywood love scene, then I ain't taking no test. That's embarrassing. Tell me about it but she got a taste of poetic justice when Justin Timberlake popped her boob out at the Super Bowl. (laughs) Kyle from Chicago, say hello to Tupac Shakur. Ayo, Pac, which one of your islands are you hiding out on right now? He's dead, Kyle. It's cool. I'm used to it. I want to know when did you and Biggie start having a beef with each other? Look, me and Biggie were tight at one point. I obsessed over his first single, Party and Bullshit. I mean, me and my posse thought he was a dope rapper. We became close after I invited him and his group over to my house in California. He always slept on my couch whenever he came to visit, which is why I had to take precautionary measures like using plastic slipcovers. And what exactly did you do for him? I trained him. Biggie was my lieutenant. I used to tell him, if you want to make your money, you have to rap for the woman. Do not rap for the brothers. The women will buy your albums. The brothers will want what they want. Now, weren't you dating Madonna around this time? Who wasn't dating Madonna in the 90s? It was good for a while, but I had to break it off with her. You dumped Madonna. Yep. Come to think of it, I should have asked her to take an AIDS test. Also, in 93, you were filming Above the Rim. And that's when the beef started? Yeah. When I got the part of Birdie, he was an East Coast drug dealer. I wanted to study men who I felt played the role in real life. That's when I met Haitian Jack and Jimmy Henchman Roseman, two drug dealing music executives who promised to hold me down in New York. I considered them dead men walking after the way they handled the crazy accusations by that girl I brought to the hotel. What happened, Pac? I met this girl partying at Nails in Manhattan. We started messing around on the dance floor. Then I took her to my hotel that night. Four days later, she came back to my hotel with my entourage being there, including Haitian Jack. She gave me a massage in my bedroom, then left me. I fell asleep, and next thing you know, I wake up to her screaming rape. I did nothing to her. But they convicted me of first-degree sexual abuse. Did anyone else get charged? No. It was because of my name and what I represented in the public view, which was an outlaw mentality. So they felt if they could punish me, then they could punish other people not as brave as I am. And nobody would speak out against society. You should have hung out with Stormy Daniels. It would have only cost you 130 grand. True. I didn't even get a spanking. So I had to go back to the studio to make some quick money. I had lawyers to pay, plus my extended family. It seems I was supporting everybody. Jimmy Hedgeman invited me to the studio in Times Square to do a cameo verse for $7,000. Biggie and Puffy were upstairs recording as well. When my crew and I got to the lobby, these two black dudes in army fatigues pulled out a 9mm and tried to steal my jewels. 
I resisted and ended up getting shot five times. I don't know how you survived that, Pac. Well, I don't know either. Although 50 Cent got shot nine times and he's still out there selling smart water. So there you are, lying on the floor in the recording studio. I ended up playing possum until they left, then dragged myself to the elevator. When the doors opened, Puffy, Biggie, and Henchman were standing there looking surprised and guilty. In the ambulance, all I could think about was that a couple of brothers had shot me. I never thought a black person would do that, like I was their representative. Anyway, the next day, I had to go back to court and be sentenced for the bogus rape. You went to court the very next day? I had to show the judge it wasn't some fake publicity stunt. But honestly, I knew my fate because the judge didn't look at me or my lawyer once during the entire case. And? I was sentenced to 18 months in maximum security prison in upstate New York. At this point, I was broke. Prison was killing my spirit. I was in solitary confinement for the first eight months and about to quit the music business. But then, while I was alone in the cell, my album hit number one and it woke me up again. Which made you the only artist in history with a number one album while in prison. Even Tommy Lee couldn't pull that off. Yeah, me against the world. There was a song on that album called Dear Mama that I wrote for my mom and also for Jada's mom because both had struggled with drug addiction and I felt I owed my mom something deep. She was my homie. I mean, we went through our stages where first we were mother and son, then it was drill sergeant and cadet, then it was like dictator and little country. So Me Against the World was my favorite album. Even rappers today like J. Cole and Kendrick Lamar cite this album as one of their favorites. I wonder what Jada's husband, Will Smith, thought about it, having started as a rapper and all. Will Smith ain't no rapper. Unless you think Donny Osmond is a rapper. Or Kanye West at this point, that lame-ass bitch. Plus, it turns out that old Will wanted to have an open marriage with Jada. So she opened the door and left. Ouch! You know, as I sat there in prison, what really got me fired up was when I started hearing rumors that it was one of Biggie's boys who gunned me down. He owed me more than just to turn his head and act like he didn't know who I was. We have another caller. Go for it. Hey, Tupac. My name is Joe Nathan Jackson III from Greenwich, Connecticut. I've been in love with the rapping music since I was a child. I want to know who were some of your special lady friends, or honeys, as you would say. Since you bring it up, Madonna was real nice. She's a good person who helped me out like a homeboy. Although my homies didn't massage my nuts with baby oil while giving me head, and she certainly did that. And actresses like Jasmine Guy and Rosie Perez were good supporters. And Jada Smith, like I said earlier. But my best friend, I have to say, was my wife. Because when I was in jail, she reached out to Suge Knight to help me pay for everything. Hold up. You were married? Why is this the first time I'm hearing about it? I knew about it. Tupac. How long were you and your wife together? Look, we were only married for 10 months right before I went to jail. Sancho showed up and she got it annulled a month before I got out. I married her for the wrong reasons and I'll just leave it at that. Who's Sancho? <laughs> Sancho is the name of every guy who shows up when a man goes to prison. It's an inside joke. Sancho takes good care of the woman then disappears on the day her man is released. Got it. And you said you reached out to Suge Knight when you were incarcerated. I wasn't trusting anybody at this point, but Suge was there and had my back when he came to visit me in prison. I agreed to join his death row records and told him, I need you to ride with me because I'm going to destroy Puff Daddy's bad boy records. I believe they had something to do with having me shot. So Suge pledged his loyalty to me, but I had to make three albums for them. The rest is history. But I read in 2011 that the prisoner in New York named Dexter Isaac claimed he was the one who shot you. That's what they said, but I don't believe it. 
Hey, one more thing. I once read that you had a bit part on a Cosby episode. I, I mean, what was it like working with Bill Cosby? Was he a nice guy? He was to me. Very pleasant guy as far as I can recall. But my memory of Bill faded immediately after we worked together. Not sure why. Ha! <laughs> Did you hear about all the trouble he in now? <laughs> of course. Who doesn't know about all that? I'm sure being convicted was a bitter pill for him to swallow. Thanks, Joe Nathan. Tupac, are you aware that Bill Cosby once said that black people need to pull their pants up, put their hats on straight, and learn to speak English? Do you have any thoughts on that statement? Sure, I have thoughts on it. Have you ever seen a metal lid on a trash can? Of course. <laughs> well, since he's in prison, Bill's going to need to strap one of those to his ass. Getting back to your music, All Eyes on Me was the last album you would release while you were alive. Why did you choose that title? Because that's how I felt it was. I got the police and the feds watching me. I had females that wanted to charge me with false shit and sue me. I got the jealous homeboys and I got the homies that rolled with me. So All Eyes on Me. It was the first double disc rap album. I remember it well. Okay, we have Carla Jones from Baltimore on the line. All right, Tupac, I want to know, how is it that you're dead, but you keep putting out new albums and singles like every other year? That's because after I got out of prison, I was recording at least three songs a day. I recorded 150 songs in my last year alone. Wow, how is that possible? Because that's what you're supposed to do as a rapper. I felt that rappers who could not perform their verses on the first try weren't ready to be rappers. So, all in all, how many albums did you make? I made 11 albums, seven of which were released after my death. So far, I've sold over 75 million copies. And if you really want to know something, check this out. Last year, I made 9 million more than Eminem and 50 Cent. And my favorite drink is Hennessy on the Rocks. Did you really sleep with Faith Evans, Diggy Small's wife, as retaliation like you said in your diss track, Hit Him Up? Ha! <laughs> She says it never happened, but I hit that bitch like a snowplow at a Denver airport. Just check out that birthmark on her left thigh, way up there. The truth is, Biggie was really pretty small. Oh, and what did you think of Snoop Dogg? At one point, we were friends. Hell, I was the one who gave Snoop his first blunt. But we had a falling out because he wanted me to get over hating on Biggie and rise above it. He wanted you to get over hating on the guy who had you shot? Yeah, but I'm funny that way. I wasn't about to get over it. I did let Snoop's wife give me a blowjob, which was world class, by the way. Oh, Tupac. Oh, Carla. I almost forgot. Can you tell me why you changed the name of your publishing company? Absolutely. There was a wonderful little boy named Joshua Torres. He was 11 years old, and his mom called into a radio station because her son had muscular dystrophy and was about to die. She told the host it was her son's only dream in life to speak with me. Well, the station contacted my manager, and 15 minutes later, I called Joshua. He didn't have long, so I hopped on a jet in New York and flew to Aberdeen, Maryland, and paid him a surprise visit. He was really depressed, but we had a great visit and rapped together, and he started laughing and singing, and his eyes lit up. Two hours after I left, he passed away. That's when I renamed my publishing company to Joshua's Dream. I love that kid. Aw, oh, that's so sweet, Tupac. It seems that despite everything you had to go through, life was good. It sure was. Up until that little trip to Las Vegas on September 7th, 1996. Suge took me to the Mike Tyson fight. Yes. You and Suge were in his BMW. He was driving, and according to the police... A vehicle pulled up beside you, shots were fired, and you both got hit. Well, I got hit four times and he got hit once. Yeah, everybody thinks they were after me or that Suge set me up. But the truth is, they were after him, but I got killed. Not right away, though. Lucky me, I got to be in a hospital for six long days before I died. My mom's and my fiancé, Kidada, were by my side. But that didn't stop Suge and Death Row from releasing my next album a month after I was gone. They wanted to make money, no doubt. 
always. But I died broke and in debt to death row and Suge Knight. You must be aware that Suge is in R.J. Donovan State Prison in San Diego on manslaughter charges for running a guy over with his SUV. Is there anything you'd like to say to him now? Yes. Hey, Suge, I hear that they have a good automotive program in there. So I hope you get your ass drilled out like an engine block. Thanks for nothing, dude. We have time for one more caller. Hey, Tupac! My name is Cameron from Santa Barbara, and I just wanted to say thank you for all the great music you gave the world. Fortunately, I read that your mom was able to get ownership of your music back from Suge Knight and Death Row Records. Yes, she did. My mom's proved in court they defrauded me. Then she took the money and opened the Tupac Amaru Shakur Center for the Arts in 1997. We helped young artists in poverty to express themselves. Like I told you, my mom's was a real fighter. Hey, do you have any regrets in your life? Like the Sinatra song? Yeah, regrets. I've had a few. Not marrying Jada would be my biggest regret. Going to that hotel with the crazy woman who accused me of rape is up there. And at the top of the list would be getting in that car with Suge. And maybe Forrest Gump. What about Forrest Gump? I got to audition for the part of Bubba, the shrimp guy. Had I done better, I would have gotten the part. I never read about that. You would have made a good Bubba, I think. And not the type of Bubba that Suge Knight and Bill Cosby are hanging out with. And my tattoo, I don't think I'll get that again. The one across your stomach that says thug life? It was an impulsive decision. I take more time to think these days. Are you happy with the movies that have been made about you? Not really. All Eyes on Me was okay. And Demetrius Ship Jr., the actor who played me, did his best with what he was given. Was it a great movie? No. Did they get all the facts right about my life? Hell no. But that's Hollywood for you. I will say, I'm still proud of the work done around the movie. And I'm happy it was done by a black producer and director. But if you want to watch a great movie about my life, watch the documentary Tupac Resurrection. There's a reason it was nominated for an Academy Award. Should have won. Tupac, I want to thank you for coming on the show today. Before we close out, do you have any final words of advice to up-and-coming artists who may be watching? Yeah, be born white. (laughs) And keep your sense of humor. Never lose that. Remember that old Pac told y'all to laugh. Thank you, Tupac Shakur. And thank you for joining us today in Stone Mountain, Georgia. I'm Melissa Robbins, and we'll see you again soon on the next episode of Over My Dead Body. We hope you enjoyed the sixth episode of Over My Dead Body. The entire TV series is now available as a podcast in addition to streaming on Amazon Prime. Aside from Tupac Shakur... We've interviewed Robert Kardashian, Nostradamus, Steve Jobs, Mae West, and Richard Nixon. Upcoming guests include Julia Child, Walter Cronkite, Mark Twain, Howard Cosell, Sigmund Freud, Jimmy Stewart, Albert Einstein, and Phyllis Diller. All told, we plan to produce 60 episodes, and perhaps as many as 300 of them. One thing's for certain... There's no shortage of interesting guests and more seem to arrive every day. The executive producer of this episode is yours truly, Stephen Kunis. Over My Dead Body was created and written by me, Stephen Kunis, and this episode was hosted by Melissa Robbins. Tupac Shakur was portrayed by Tuchuku Anachankia. Try saying that three times fast. The telephone callers were played by Frank Gerard, well, three of them anyway, and Stacy Storrs. Sound recording and editing was done by Zach Devine. The catchy theme music, both at the beginning and end of the show, was composed and performed by the great Marty Criswanis. Very special thanks to Norman Lear, my mentor and friend for almost 40 years, and to my old boss, Johnny Carson for suggesting that a talk show with a fantasy wish lists of guests would be a wonderful idea. 
Finally, our sincere appreciation to Barbara Carlin at r and Music Studios in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, for making her space available to us during the pandemic. The show must go on.